take a high level look now at some frameworks for strategic analysis. As we've already seen, putting our strategic business plan together involves two phases, formulation and implementation. And the first phase of this is analysis. But the question that I haven't answered and I want to introduce you to now is, how do we go about this analysis? What tools can we use to help us think objectively and analytically about our business? Because without such frameworks, without these tools, uh, it's very difficult to make judgments and to make evaluations just by looking at the business itself because you have nothing to measure it against. You have no framework at all. It's a bit like trying to change a wheel on a car without a jack and a spanner. So let's go through a number of these. I'm going to look at uh, a lot of these in a lot more detail in the next section. But in this section, I just want to introduce them to you because if you are new to some of these, then again, I want to get them in your mind and show you that there are a range of different tools before d diving into them in great detail that you can use. And the first of these is portfolio theory. And portfolio theory is very straightforward. It makes you look at the assets in the business as you would like a share portfolio. And you're basically saying for each asset, are you getting a an adequate risk adjusted return from those assets. So you can do cost benefit analysis to review your resource allocation of assets within your business. And this helps you to financially evaluate uh, whether you've got the right mix of assets within the business, because you might be able to find a different asset which will give you a better risk reward return than um, the current asset you have in the business. The growth share matrix is a Boston Consulting Group uh, grid. They like these four square grids. And it basically, at an individual business level, uh, looks at um, two axes, market share and industry growth rate. And uh, clearly, um, the market share is a measure of how competitive the business is in the, in the market. And the industry growth rate is a measure of how attractive that particular industry is. And it helps you to see where your businesses are positioned. And therefore, you can make evaluations about which ones you should reinforce with investment and which ones you should pull investment back from. Core competence is um, a technique which argues that your business should be the best at what it does in the market and you should just focus on that and anything else that doesn't contribute to reinforcing your business's core competence should be disposed of. It helps you to establish your business with a very strong competitive position and a very clear market offering to customers. The experience curve is relatively straightforward as well. Basically, it's saying the more you do of something, the better you will get at it, because when the volume of output goes up, the costs, the value added costs decline by a consistent percentage. So the, you, the more you do, the better you get and the less it costs you. Uh, I, I'm sure intuitively you can understand where the position, the, the experience curve is coming from. Now let's look at a number of the great Michael Porter's models. And I really like Michael Porter. And when I was doing my MBA back in the early 1990s um, at Cass Business School, we studied his, his work a lot and read a lot of his books. And the first of these is competitive advantage. And the, the argument here is basically um, looking at the market position of your business compared to your competition. And Michael Porter argues that you can only really have one of two viable strategies. You can either be the low cost producer, in which case you can have the lowest costs and the lowest prices in the market and compete. And everybody else uh, either lo loses money because they're trying to reduce their costs, reduce their prices to match yours and their costs are too high um, or basically they go out of business. The alternative is to differentiate your product so well, um, an Apple iPhone, for instance, that actually it's not a question of price. The product is so brilliant and so unique. People will pay whatever you ask for, to get their hands on it. And so, you know, there's two very different approaches to the market. 
but you have to adopt one or the other. And if you fall in the middle, then competitors on either side of you with one strategy or the other will outcompete you. Essentially, it's a focus on brand, on products and services. Michael Porter's generic competitive strategies of cost leadership and differentiation um, basically encourage you to create economies of scale in order to achieve low cost production or specialization to create new unique products which are not price sensitive. Michael Porter's also got a model which is his five forces model and this looks at the industry structure and its, comp com uh, its profitability. The first of these five forces is the threat of new entrants and if you think about the company being in the middle uh, then basically coming from above you've got the, the possibility of people coming in and taking market share, disrupting the market. If the market's attractive and competitive, it will attract new entrants. However, if there are barriers to entry, such as intellectual property rights, cap high capital requirements, strong customer loyalty, existing economies of scale, it makes it much more difficult for these new entrants to come into the market. The threat of substitutes means basically your products are easily duplicated by somebody else. So if I made um, a box of tissues, uh, it's not very difficult for somebody else to make another box of tissues. And it's easy for customers to look on the shelves and saying, oh, well, there's this box of tissues here or that box of tissues there. Which one am I going to go for? Which is why uh, tissue boxes tend to be quite str you know, strongly branded to try to build customer loyalty. The bargaining power of customers uh, enables customers to keep prices down um, against sellers who want to increase their profitability. And it's this tug between, um, the, you know, if, if a, a customer has a lot of choice in the market, then they can play one seller off against each other and keep the prices down. If the seller is selling a unique product in the market or there isn't a locally available alternative, then they don't have that power and the seller can set the price. The bargaining power of suppliers is the reverse of that. This is where if many suppliers have access to the raw materials, then they um, will have relatively weak power because the buyer will be able to play one against the other. However, if there's a supplier with a, access to a unique raw material and you can't buy it anywhere else, they can set the price they want for that uh, raw material. And finally, the issue of competitive rivalry. It's really how competitive is the market. And if you have a highly competitive market, you, it, the market would encourage you to continue to develop your product and innovate in order to try to uh, move away from your competition. But a highly competitive market will keep prices keen and make it difficult for people to raise their prices. Let's look at SWOT analysis, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, uh, a classic uh, piece of uh, strategic analysis, which uh, enables you to look at the internal part of your um, business, strengths and weaknesses, and then the external market for your business and the industry conditions, opportunities and threats. So again, it, it sits across two and indeed th all three of the areas of our strategic analysis, which are the internal, the external and the industry. Value chain is where you look at the primary activities of a business horizontally, which are the inbound and outbound logistics, then operations, marketing and sales and servicing. So you're looking at um, the value added from the raw material coming into the firm and, and seeing where you can get efficiencies and cost savings and shorten and make the process, internal process, more efficient. Uh, underneath that, you then have the support activities, things like human resources, technology, procurement and infrastructure, which again help those that, that main value chain to operate. And what you're looking for in your strategic analysis is how to make that process better, more efficient, more cost effective. 
So that's an introduction to strategic analysis frameworks. I'm hoping to, well, I will go into these in a lot more detail, but the purpose of this lecture was to introduce these ideas to you so that when we go into them in more detail, you have reference to where they sit in comparison to the others, and you're beginning to get an idea of um, strategic analysis and how to best conduct it for your business.